Amen. You may be seated. And children, four years through sixth grade, you guys can be dismissed to go with Miss Carol back to room six for KWC Junior. You guys have a great time back there. Parents, grandparents, you can pick them up in room six after service. Love that song, House of the Lord. I have a question, though, for you. I just want you to think about this uh, internally, not looking for a, a verbal answer. Just want you to think about it. What makes your house your house? Other than, other than like your name's on the title or whatever, you know, other than ownership, like what makes your house your house? Several years ago, my youngest brother and his wife uh, bought the house that my parents had built. Um, we moved in the summer after my kindergarten year, right before Lance, my youngest brother, uh, was born. And uh, several years ago, they ended up buying the house, and they've made, they've made a variety of changes, mostly to the outside. He's a landscaper, and so they've done a lot of work on the outside, taking what my dad had started and, and kind of what my da- the dreams that my dad had with having a fish pond and everything, and, and just like taking it to a whole nother level. Amazing, amazing things. But back at the beginning of this year, they started a new project on the inside. And it wasn't too far into the project that my brother messaged uh, both Lester and I and said basically like he's feeling bad about making the changes to the house. And I'm like, well, we both replied back in, through Messenger, hey, uh, we have great memories there and, and, you know, the house served us well, but it's, it's not our house, it's, it's your house. It's not mom and dad's house, it's it's your house. You do whatever you need to do to make it your house. Well, he's doing what he wants to do, needs to do to make it their house. They've torn out walls. They're opening stuff up. They're completely redoing the kitchen. They're, they're taking the utility room. What we grew up with is the utility room, the laundry room. They're making that a, a walk-in pantry with, with countertops and everything. They're taking the, instead of the utility room being there, they're actually taking that into what was the garage, which we didn't really, like, we never put cars in there. It was just kind of a storage area, whatever, but they moved the the living room wall, part of the garage, but then making the rest of the garage a utility room, laundry room, like, huge laundry room. A a lot, like, a lot of different changes, right? There, he he took down the, I can't believe he did this. He took down the mantle that held my soccer trophies, my ba- basketball trophies, my baseball trophies. Took that down and the, the stonework around that, completely redid the stonework. Uh, he and his couple sons, uh, they, they redid the stonework and they put in a new mantle piece that they had cut out and everything. But a lot, like all kinds of changes that they made to the house. Why? Because they wanted to change the form and the function of the house to fit their needs, to fit he and his wife and their kids, their lifestyle, their purposes, their priorities. I'm guessing you might be able to start thinking through like the changes that they've made, just a little bit that I've described, and start thinking, well, what are their values and, and how does it how does the house maybe function? What, what are they looking for as they've made these changes? And maybe you've come to maybe these three conclusions. One, somebody in that house must really like to cook if they're going to have a walk-in pantry. Somebody must enjoy time in the kitchen. And I see some of you looking around going, sounds like somebody else I know. Somebody must really enjoy time in the kitchen. And you, and you would be right if you came to that conclusion. If you thought they must really enjoy, like, being together and having other people around, like opening walls, open concept, and, and being able to enjoy one another's presence, a, a larger family room to gather in, and, and being able to, like, eliminate sight lines, and just being able to enjoy each other's company and, and host larger crowds. If you thought of that, you, you would be right. They love having other people over. They've got four kids, um, 
basically 20 through like 13 or 14, somewhere in there. And, and they love, you know, they've got their kids and then their kids have friends and my nephews are in town and, and they've got all kinds of people that they just have coming in and going and stuff inside, outside, love to host people at their house. And so if you thought that as I described the changes, you'd be absolutely correct. And then if you think, huh, they must have like a lot of dirty clothes if they like decided to make a larger uh, utility room, laundry room. Like they must have like a lot of dirty clothes. Well, again, my brother's a landscaper and they have four basically teenagers and they live out in the country and they have animals and they have a pond and then they have a neighbor pond that they have full access to and like they get dirty they get muddy they're highly highly active family so yes if you thought yep they must have a lot of dirty laundry to do you would be absolutely correct now why do i tell you all of that because as we look at the house of the lord today i think we should be able to pick up on like some priorities some things that are important to the lord some things that like what makes this the house of the lord like what sets this apart from other places why is this different and and ultimately what does this tell us about god and what does this tell us about us and so if you have your bible that's where we're going to go after today we're going to look at answering that question what does the house of the lord tell us about God, and then, and like, kind of from there, what does it tell us about us? We're going to be in Hebrews chapter 9, it's page 850, if you want to grab one of the KWC Bibles. Lots of great insight that the Hebrew writer gives here as he continues to lay out the, the grand case of why Jesus is better, why Jesus is greater, and, and why Jesus is our anchor. And in doing so, in chapter 9, we're going to see that he, he dives more into talking about the tabernacle, the temple, the sanctuary, the house of the Lord. He's been talking about priests and their function. Now he's going to talk more specifically about the house of the Lord or the tabernacle. We pick it up, chapter 9 of Hebrews, verse 1. Now, the first covenant had regulations for worship and also an earthly sanctuary. So, again, he's doing comparison, Jesus and others. Jesus and Moses, the, the old covenant that was instituted with Moses and the Ten Commandments and an earthly tabernacle and Jesus, the new covenant and a different kind of tabernacle that he's going to mention. A tabernacle was set up, so they had... In Moses' day, they had a what was also called a tent of meeting. So the tabernacle was portable. It had to be because they were going through the wilderness. But God set up a tabernacle and gave Moses specific directions. And we saw this in a previous chapter. And I said, well, we'll talk more about that later. Well, this is later. So specific instructions because it was to be a copy of, of what is in heaven and so they would travel with it the priests would carry different sections of the tabernacle and those different things that were part of the tabernacle and then they would they would camp out when the spirit of the lord led them to a place and and stopped there that's where they would set up camp and they would set up the earthly sanctuary the the tabernacle in its first room where the lampstand and the table with its consecrated bread. This was called the holy place. Behind the second curtain, so if there's a second curtain, that implies that there's what? A first curtain. Somebody's really with it today. Thank you. Behind the second curtain was a room called the most holy place, which had the golden altar of incense and the gold-covered Ark of the Covenant. This ark contained the gold jar of manna, Aaron's staff that had budded, and the stone tablets of the covenant. And then above the ark were the cherubim of the glory, overshadowing the atonement cover. The atonement cover is also known as the mercy seat. I'm going to pause right there. Now, some of you 
when you read or you hear something being read and, and there's some uh, words that are used to describe and all of that, you can start picturing something in your mind. Some of you, I know, you, you're really good at that. Some of us are a little more challenged with that, if we're to be honest today. Like, I, I can't picture that. It, it's kind of like when you go out to eat and you grab a menu, right? They give you a menu and you start looking at the menu and like, I don't know, it kind of sounds good, but I'm not sure if I want that or not. But then you look down and if the menu has pictures, which most of them do, like, ooh, that, that's what I want, right? Because the, the picture gives you an actual image. You, you, some of you, you're good. You can read through and like, yep, I like this, I like that, and that sounds good together. I can picture that. I can even start to taste it. But some of us, we can't taste it until like we start to see it. And like, oh, that's what that would be like. That's what they're describing. So, so let me help you out. And just in case you're one of those, and I'm one of those, where it, it's helpful for me to have more of a visual. So I created this drawing. It's pretty good. I, I'm, you know, okay, I'm being sarcastic. But we see in Scripture that it describes a place that was set up. It's about the fourth of a football field, the, the total parameter here. Uh, basically, a fence would be established in the, the center of wherever they were camping out. A fence would be established, and then they would have a place where the sacrifices were made. So the animals were brought to here. They would be sacrificed in the, in the courtyard. They'd be placed on the altar. The altar had four horns, one on each corner, that blood would be dipped on. It would be part of the sacrifice that was being made for the sins of the people or for them to be cleansed. And then there was a, a bronze labor where the priests would go and wash their hands and do ceremonial cleansing. All of that was, was taking place in the, the outside, the, the courtyard. Now, the Hebrew writer doesn't mention any of that. We're not going to spend a lot of time on this part. What the Hebrew writer is really focusing in on is this 45 foot by 15 foot two room dwelling place or tabernacle. And he talks about the outer room, which is 30 feet, approximately 30 feet by 15 feet, called the holy place. And then behind the second curtain, so a curtain here, behind the second curtain is the holy of holies, or also known as the most holy place. Now, this is a, a pretty crude drawing, I will admit. And so to help you out, I borrowed this from the internet, and hopefully you can see it, especially a little better on the, the bigger screens. But we'll, we'll just kind of walk through this. I, I want you to pay attention, you know, like pay attention to the colors, because the colors God picked out. God was the exterior and interior designer, and only God, for his house. He had some colors that... He wanted specifically, he, he wanted blue, he wanted purple, and he wanted red. We'll also see white, but primarily we see blue and purple, which are colors of royalty. We, we also see red because that's an indication, it, it signifies red, uh, signifies blood, okay? But behind the, going in from the first curtain, the, the priests would enter in, and we have the, the table of showbread. And on the table of showbread would be two stacks, six loaves of bread in each stack. And on, on the bread, they would sprinkle frankincense. Does frankincense sound familiar? It was what the kings, maybe three kings, we don't know, but the kings, the wise men brought for Jesus after he was born, right? But frankincense, something that was used by priests, was put on top of the bread, and it would sit there for a week. But 12 loaves represented the 12 tribes. 
you think of, we even have the term breaking bread together. What does that mean? It's fellowship. They're eating a meal together, it, but it, it signifies fellowship, relationship. And, and so there was a reminder of the relationship that God had with the 12 tribes of Israel. And then on the Sabbath, the priest would present new loaves of bread, and the, the priests were then able to eat the bread themselves. We see Jesus reference a time when David is on the run from Saul, and he's hungry, and he goes to the priest, Ahimelech, and Ahimelech, and he asks Ahimelech for something to eat, and Ahimelech lets him eat the showbread from inside the holy place. But we also see the candelabra, the light stand. The light stand was made specifically to look like a, a tree trunk that had six branches coming out on the side, three on each side, and then one in the middle, six branches on the sides to represent the number of man. But the seventh one in the middle is a reminder that man is incomplete without the Lord, that we need him. And on the top of them were the buds of an almond tree. The almond tree was known to be the first to produce fruit in the land. And so we have a reminder of the, the first fruits and, and that we're to, to give our first fruits to the Lord, but also that the light was the only source in the tabernacle, the only way that they could see what to do. And so it was important that they kept the oil in the lamp continually burning before the Lord day and night. And then we have the altar of incense. All of these laden with gold and incense in Scripture often represented the prayers of the people. And, and we see that uh, David mentions that. Uh, he talks about it in, in Scripture in Psalm 141, verse 2. He says, may my prayer be set before you like incense. And then in his vision of heaven, John saw that the elders around the throne were holding golden bowls full of incense. Revelation 5, 8 says, which are the prayers of the people. Now, an interesting note, in Hebrews chapter 9, the Hebrews writer actually has this altar of incense on the inside of the Holy of Holies. And there are a variety of scholars that have offered their explanation on why the discrepancy and does it really matter and all of that. And I'm not going to get into that. I, I don't really think it's that big of a discrepancy, especially if you understand the purpose and what happened and, and knowing that on the Day of Atonement, so one day out of the year, the priest would make a sacrifice, the high priest would make a sacrifice, would dip the blood on the four horns of the altar of incense, before going into the Holy of Holies. And so it was always connected to going before the, the known presence of God in the Holy of Holies and going before the mercy seat. So beyond the second curtain, the most holy place, the Holy of Holies, was the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant had a lid also known as the mercy seat, or a covering, also known as the mercy seat, and that could be opened, and inside of that, Scripture says in Hebrews 9, that there were three things. Do you remember what they were? We had the manna, so there was a gold jar of manna, and then there was Aaron's uh, rod that had budded, and then the, the Ten Commandments, right? The stone tablets. Just real quickly, the, the manna that God had provided as the Israelites were wandering through the desert. There's no food in sight, and God provides from heaven bread from heaven, better than Panera, okay? That God provides for them, and it's something different, because actually manna means what is it? it they haven't seen anything like this bread before. Couldn't come up with a name for it, so they just called it what is it? It's manna. Manna from heaven, God had provided for them. And so there's this continual reminder of God's provision that they have in the Ark of the Covenant inside the Holy of Holies. They also have Aaron's rod that had budded. And, and if you know much of 
the story of Moses going to Pharaoh, you know that Aaron's rod plays a part in that. You know that at one point God told Moses to take the rod and have him throw it down and it became a snake and he said, now pick it up by the tail and, it, and then it, it turned back into a rod. Well, they did that with Pharaoh and what happened? Pharaoh's magicians were able to do the same thing. They replicated it. They took their rods, they threw it down, they became snakes, and they picked it up and it became a rod again. Except, when Aaron did it, his snake swallowed the other snakes. But something happened as they were going through the wilderness. People started to rebel against not just God, but they started to rebel against God's chosen leaders, Moses and particularly Aaron as priest. They didn't really want to listen to Aaron anymore. Didn't think that Aaron truly represented God. And so God's going to put it all to an end and say, I want you to know exactly who I want serving as the priest before me. He says, have each tribe bring their rod. A rod represented power, represented authority. Have each tribe bring a rod before me and leave it before my presence. And when they came back the next day, Aaron's rod had budded. It not just had budded, but it had produced almonds. It had produced fruit. What was dead, a rod, a, a staff, ha had actually become alive, had given life. What a great representation of God's authority and his power and his recognition that Aaron... And those that followed him in the tribe of Levi were to the, be the priests before him, to represent God before the people of Israel. And then we also have the Ten Commandments. God's rules for relationship. Four rules about a relationship with him, six rules about a relationship with others, what it looked like to walk in a covenant relationship with God Almighty. For him to be your God and for you to be his people, all inside the Ark of the Covenant, and then over the Ark of the Covenant were two cherubim, one on each side, with their wings extended, representing the angels that sit around the throne of God. And then again, it's called the mercy seat, because that is where the people ultimately were to find forgiveness. And so we have all of that, all of that, with the tabernacle, 15 by 45 with two rooms, the holy place and the holy of holies, separated by a curtain. Recognizing that this is the most holy place. No doubt about it, it was spectacular. I mean, for that day and for what they had, it was amazing. And we think about it, what does this tell us about God. And here's two things together that I think it tells us about God. God is worthy of worship and values relationship. As, as I look at what is described in the Old Testament and what's further described in the New Testament of God's tabernacle and later his temple, the house of the Lord, what I see is that God is worthy of worship, that he's a king. The colors that were used the types of materials that were used, bronze in the outer court, and then gold. The walls were overlaid with gold. The, the, the items inside the Holy of Holies and the, the holy place were, were laden with gold. It, there's, it, like, this is the place, this is the house of a king. This house is different. This house belongs to somebody that is different. When you think of the different um, items in the house of the Lord, it, it says this is somebody that is worthy of worship, his authority, his power, his provision. But I also see that he values relationship. From the bread on the table and the idea of breaking bread together, the idea of a relationship with the 12 tribes, all the way to the, the commandments and how they were establishing a relationship. And here's guidelines for how to have a right relationship with God and how to have a right relationship with others. What God wanted for his people. 
that he's worthy of worship, and that he values relationship. Now let's pick it back up with verse 5. Hebrew writer continues, but we cannot discuss these things in detail now. Oops. Uh, When everything had been arranged like this, the priests entered regularly into the outer room to carry on their ministry. So there's the priests that enter into the the holy place, the outer room, and they do their ministry. But only the high priest entered the inner room, and that only once a year, and never without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins of the people the people had committed in ignorance. We'll talk more about the blood next week in its importance. Verse 8, the Holy Spirit was showing by this that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed as long as the first tabernacle was still functioning. Again, the tabernacle is just a shadow, just a copy, just an illustration of a heavenly tabernacle, of a greater tabernacle. It's it's to kind of whet our appetite for the the true house of the Lord. Verse 9, this is an illustration for the present time indicating that the gifts and sacrifices being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. We we talked about the shortcomings of the the old covenant. It, It couldn't really address the heart. Never really could change who people were on the inside. Focused a lot more on the outside. And Jesus came to do something about that. He says, they are only a matter of food and drink and various ceremonial washings. External regulations. Applying until the time of the new order. They had a place. They had a time. They served their purpose. But they couldn't do what was ultimately needed to be done. Verse 11. But when Christ came as high priest of the good things that are now already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made with human hands. It's better. One, obviously, is because the, the tabernacle that Moses used, the tabernacle that the Hebrews were familiar with, even the temple itself that was later built by Solomon and then rebuilt years later, built with human hands. It was nice, it served a purpose, but it paled in comparison to the greater perfect tabernacle that was not made with human hands. That is to say, it's not part of this creation. It's on a whole other world, right? He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place, once for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. So it's telling us that Jesus did something in a different tabernacle, literally and figuratively. Something else happened. Something went to a a greater level, a whole other level than just the earthly tabernacle that Jesus accomplished on our behalf. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. They could take care of the outward, but they couldn't take care of the inward. But how much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death, so that we may serve the living God? Now, he just said a whole lot, some of which has been covered in other ways in the first eight chapters, and well, it'll be covered a little bit more as he continues on in chapter 9 and then into chapter 10. So a lot of the, the actual what's taking place, I'm not going to get into specifically today. I will point out that Jesus offered himself, he was unblemished, which was the criteria for any sacrifice. It had to be spotless. It, it had to be without blemish. Now, But when it's talking about an animal being unblemished, spotless, it it meant physically. It had to look right. It had to look perfect. But we see clearly that Jesus, when he presented himself, it wasn't so much about the outward. It was about his sinless life, that he was the perfect sacrifice for sins and able to accomplish something of eternity 
eternal redemption because he was spotless on the inside. He was sinless and could die, therefore, in our place. What I want to focus on is how the Hebrew writer has been talking about the earthly tabernacle being a copy, kind of a foreshadowing of a heavenly tabernacle. And I want to go back to our illustration and walk us through and and see that not just was God in the Old Testament with the tabernacle giving us a glimpse of the, the house of the Lord in heaven, but that actually the tabernacle is designed to point to Jesus. So we'll just go with the tabernacle itself, the 15 foot by 45 foot building that has two rooms. And by the colors, we're reminded of the royalty of God and the royalty of Jesus and how Jesus was pointed out to be the king of the Jews. How the centurion, as Christ was crucified, said, surely this was the son of God pointing to Jesus. As we go in, we see the the table with bread on it. Twelve loaves of bread. How many disciples did Jesus have? Good job, class. Twelve disciples. Jesus happened to say something. He says, I am the bread of life. We see that The 12 loaves of bread point to Jesus. How Jesus is the only one who truly satisfies. We we come to the lampstand. And Jesus says, I am the light of the world. It's interesting as we look at Scripture and we see not only did Jesus say that he is the light of the world. But in Revelation 21, verse 22, John is finishing up his, his report of everything that he saw as, as God gave him a glimpse of heaven, a, a glimpse of the end times, a, a glimpse of eternity, a glimpse of the holy city. And in Revelation 21, verse 22, he says... I, Speaking of the city, he says, I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light. And catch this, and the Lamb is the lamp. So the lampstand that we have in the tabernacle was, was there all along to point people to Jesus. That he's the light of the world. That the city of heaven, the new Jerusalem, doesn't doesn't need the sun or the moon. You don't have to worry about spending $100 to buy a pair of glasses so that you can watch the eclipse. No need for sun or moon because the glory of God is its light and the lamb is its lamp. We, We go on beyond and and we see the altar of incense and we see in scripture the picture of the intercession of Christ and how Christ prayed for his disciples and those that would follow them. He prayed for us and we we see the the altar of sacrifice in the courtyard was a type of Christ's death on our behalf but we also see the altar of incense in the holy place was a type of Christ's mediation on our behalf. The prayers of the Lord going before the throne of God, the prayers of Jesus, our mediator, the book of Hebrews has taught, taught to us about being our priest, that he, he goes before us. He's our mediator. He's our go-between. He prays on our behalf. And that the incense was to be burning continually. Perpetual nature of Christ's mediation. The scripture said, we just read it not too long ago of Christ sitting on the throne, the the mercy seat essentially, eternally, before God, representing us. Amazing picture that the tabernacle provides pointing to Jesus. And then we go into the most holy place and we see the Ark of the Covenant. 
and inside the Ark of the Covenant, we see the jar of manna. And again, it was pointing to Jesus, and Jesus points this out. He pulls this out, the image that, that they would have been familiar with. It's oftentimes lost on us because we didn't grow up in that generation. We weren't exposed to all the, the ways of the Hebrews. But in Scripture, Jesus says the, these words, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. And then he says, this bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. So we see that the, the jar of manna not just pointed back to God's provision for them as they walk through the wilderness, but that the manna pointed forward to the true bread of life, the true bread from heaven that would give eternal life. We see as we look at the, the rod of Aaron that budded, we see that Jesus is prophesied in Isaiah as the rod of Jesse. We see that Jesus had authority. He spoke with authority like none other. We see that God the Father gave his stamp of approval as Jesus being the high priest forever, much like he did for Aaron when he turned something that was dead and brought life from it. When Jesus rose from the grave, it was the final stamp of God saying, this is the eternal high priest before me. What was dead now gives life. And then we see the Ten Commandments. And we see that Jesus came to fulfill the, can the commandments, to dot every I, to cross every T. Fulfill them perfectly. Walked in a perfect relationship with God and loved others as himself. The first four and the last six nailed it. And when Jesus was nailed on the cross and took his final breath, the curtain that separated the holy place from the most holy place was torn in two. But it's important to recognize how Scripture records particularly in Matthew, how Matthew records that the temple curtain was torn. How did it tear? From the top down. It wasn't man being able to tear the curtain. It was the body of Christ being torn in two. And as the body of Christ was torn in two, the Lord gave a very visual illustration to say, this curtain has been torn in two. I have torn it for you so that you can have access, not just the, the high priest on one day out of the year, but that we can all have access into the very presence of God around the clock for all time, for all people, that we could have access before him. You see, the tabernacle didn't just point to Jesus. Jesus is the greater tabernacle. When Jesus came to earth, he called himself the temple, another word for tabernacle, the, the longer, more permanent replacement of the tabernacle. John chapter 1 tells us that he came to earth and dwelt among us. The word that's used there for dwell is the same as tabernacle. It's, in other words, he tabernacled among us. What does this tell us about Jesus? Well, I think very similar to what the tabernacle told us about God is that Jesus is worthy of your worship and values your relationship. He's worthy of worship and values your relationship. And so how do we respond to that? How do you respond to that? Well, let me just kind of give you a little bit of pushback because I think you might just naturally lean a certain direction because there's two parts to this. And 
And though I'm going to separate them, they're not really separate. They're, they're not like automatic opposites of one another. They go hand in hand. We, we should be doing both, but most people that I know kind of lean more uh, one direction or the other. We, we find it easier to think of the reverence of God, to, to have respect. And we, 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 it's easy to put respect on His name. We're going to worship. And, and, and we're focused in on God. And we're focused in on praising His name. And, and we want to we want to look a certain way and dress a certain way, and there's rituals and all of that. And here's the thing. Rituals aren't bad if the rituals actually point you to Jesus. But the Hebrew writer knew that there are a lot of rituals that didn't really change the heart. But for some of us, worship's not really the issue as far as, like, we, we love singing the songs of worship, and, and when we sing them, it's not just to sing songs, it's, it's really worship. We're really lifting up in the name of the Lord, and, and we come before Him, and we gather together, and there's, there's respect, and there's reverence. As we go through our day, we're, we're mindful of His holiness and how majestic God is, and we don't want to do anything to bring shame to His name, and we should live that way. And so for some of you, and we come to this and like, what's the practical application? Like, well, I, I need to continue. I, I need to make sure that I'm, I'm walking in holiness. I, I need to make sure that I'm walking in reverence, that I'm giving honor and glory to his name. And yes, you need to do that. But for some of you, I think you need to, you need to put more focus on the, and he values your relationship. Because sometimes, sometimes, Worship and the things associated with worship don't really involve relationship. It can be easy to not focus on truly just being with Him. And just like we have the 12 loaves of bread to, to remember, like, Jesus broke bread with the disciples. He ate with them. Like, he, he lived life with them. That God wants to live life with us. He, he wants us to live life with Him. And so we think about even the placement of the tabernacle. It was in the, the center of the camp. It, it was to be a place of worship where, where our eyes are focused on God. He's our center. Our life revolves around Him. That's worship. But also to keep in mind that God specifically wanted the tabernacle to be in the middle of the, t the camp because he, he chose the tabernacle to dwell among them, to be with them, to have relationship with him. And some of you, you're all about that, all about relationship, all about relationship. And, and one of the things that I see is there's a little bit of a tendency in today's church, church with a capital C, so not just Kingston Wesleyan Church, but there's more and more like, hey, there's even a shirt some years ago, Jesus is my homeboy. Like, like embracing this relationship idea with God, that it's not just about religion, it's not just about rules and all of this and, and reverence and and like you gotta watch yourself, like you can be real with him. And so some of us we need to learn how to be more real with him and embrace the relationship that he values. Some of us need to learn how to be more reverent with him and embrace the worship aspect of which he's worthy. What I've learned of myself is that I have a leaning. And it's most likely that you have a leaning as well. And so when we come to a practical application, a person, personal application today, your natural leaning most likely is saying, well, I need to do what you're already more inclined to do. I just want to provide just a little bit of pushback, a little bit of invitation 
to consider that God is calling you to put more emphasis on the other side of the coin. And so for some of you, it's, let's focus a little bit more on the relationship aspect with the Lord. And for some of you, it's, I need to put more emphasis on the reverence side of the relationship. Because he is worthy of my worship. He's worthy of my reverence. He, he is Lord. He's king. And to walk in that beautiful tension of serving him as king and knowing him as friend. That, my friends, is where God wants us to live. In the house of the Lord. Would you stand with me if you're able? Father, I thank you, Lord, for your love for us that is clearly demonstrated as we look at the tabernacle and we look at what has been accomplished, what Christ has done for us, there's no doubt of your love for us. There's also no doubt that you're worthy of worship, that you are almighty God, the King of kings. And so, Father, may we bring both of those before your throne today, a holy reverence, for you, but also a deep desire to walk in intimacy with the one who loves us in a, in a real relationship. May that be so. I pray this in and for your name.